good evening good evening all uh, welcome you uh, to this presentation by dr k n shrikant on the modern concepts management of arthritis uh, you know my name is shrikant myself and i'm i i live in bangalore uh, so many of you who are on the meeting know me uh, so so you know i've been working uh, with with companies like johnson and johnson and merrill life sciences and i know dr shrikant uh, you know as a professional colleague since about 2014 um and and i thought this is a good opportunity for me on a weekend to invite him and uh, request him to share his views on the modern concepts in the management of arthritis of the knee and the hip uh so so i think we are all thankful and grateful to dr shrikant for his time and uh, to take us through the modern concepts in the management of arthritis of the knee and the hip uh so without wasting much time i think i would request dr shrikant to please uh, you know go ahead with this presentation uh should you people have any questions kindly please uh, type in your questions in the chat box and i think i will be able to request dr shrikant to answer some of your questions thank you so much dr shrikant over to you welcome so thank you very much shrikant uh, good evening uh, to all the participants uh, thanks for joining uh, today uh, uh, this evening and i welcome all my patients and uh, some of the patients who are going to join uh, later on or patients whom i have already operated on so i thank them in advance as well so uh, uh, so uh, without wasting much time i will uh, get on with uh, this uh, presentation uh, shrikant i hope you are able to see the slide share can you see the first oh, yes yes we yes we can we can so let me start okay so good evening friends uh, welcome to this presentation uh, again modern concepts in management of uh, knee and hip arthritis uh, i'm going to introduce a new concept uh, called grif which is get it right first time so this is a concept which is uh, new in india but it's a concept which is uh, quite well established uh, you know in the uk and uh, probably the rest of the advanced countries uh so this uh, concept was introduced by professor tim bricks uh, from uh, royal national orthopedic hospital in uh, london way back in 2013 and it's become a cornerstone of uh, all the western practices so i'm also going to touch upon where we are in orthoplasty in 2021 because as you know science develops at a very rapid pace and even as doctors and surgeons we find it difficult to keep pace with the rapidity of uh, you know the advances in the science Uh, about myself i am dr shrikant kane i am a consultant knee hip surgeon uh, these are my qualifications uh, particularly proud to have worked in writington hospital the birthplace of joint replacement surgery in the world i was formerly a consultant in trauma and joint replacement surgery in the uk at present i am proprietor and managing director of sathvi specialty orthopedic center in gavipuram bangalore where uh, close to which ankita lives and uh, you know i am a consultant coach uh, of corporate hospitals in bangalore as well at the outset i would like to wish all of you a happy gandhi jayanti uh, today and uh, welcome you again a uh, special thanks to mr shrikant ramachandran my good friend for uh, arranging this and taking all the efforts uh, uh, briefly about myself i train in uk in all aspects of orthopedic and trauma a specialist interest in uh, computer assisted robotic uh, hip and knee surgery and patient specific implant for which i did a general medical council of the uk recognized fellowship at primat uh, teaching hospitals i also have a specialist interest in hip and knee sports and revision surgery for which i did a fellowship in even orthopedic center in bristol and the third fellowship i did uh, was in germany in hamburg with prof gurka doing septic revision surgery where we remove the infected implants and uh, put new implants in the same setting uh, these are complex procedures lasting for 4 to 6 hours and it was uh, my fortune to really work with uh, one of the world authorities on this i am proud to say that i did my ug and pg from the prestigious bangalore medical college research center bangalore i was a national merit scholar throughout and i bring experience of more than 15000 joint replacement surgeries over the last 14 years in the uk having worked in four out of five specialist orthopedic units in the uk these orthopedic units or hospitals are called centers of excellence uh, which means that uh, they have the lowest infection rate in the world really so i was really fortunate to work in four out of five because even uk trainees don't get this uh, rare chance to work in uh, so many numbers of uh, specialist hospitals i am also a director of meet the masters course which i run uh, you know 
uh, every October it's an international course and we push boundaries uh, in our understanding in knee and hip uh, replacement surgery. And one such uh, course is coming up end of uh, this month and we've got a live surgery planned uh, right from London on the latest advances. Uh, my objective in India is to provide affordable but high quality knee hip replacement and revision services in Bangalore, Karnataka and India. Uh, this was the last Meet the Masters course in 2020. Uh, here we have the hospital hip detective. So, uh, you know, we had the Professor, uh, uh, you know, uh, John Skinner here on the left hand side and Professor Alistair Hart, uh, two very big names in the in the field of orthopedics in the world. And Professor Alistair Hart is uh, putting his uh, left hand on my uh, left shoulder. And he gave a fantastic talk uh, last year in our program on the future and 3D printing in orthopedics. And we had a fantastic debate uh, uh, with him and my mentor, Mr. Edward Smith, on the way the future is going really in the next five to 10 years. And it was lovely to have him there. Uh, this, I met uh, him in Stanmore Hospitals uh, in 19, uh, 2019, just before the pandemic uh, hit uh, the world. You know, I was there in London. So this is the picture taken at that uh, time. And uh, Professor John Skinner is the president of British Orthopedic uh, Association. So two big people, uh, you know, really minos in the middle of Jane's really in, in the field of orthopedics. Uh, experience relevant to this topic, I trained in the UK in all aspects of orthopedics and trauma, speci specialist interest in uh, computer assisted robotic uh, knee hip surgery, PSI, which is patient specific implant. And this is presentation of the uh, fellowship in Plymouth Teaching Hospital by Dr. Jonathan Keenan. He's a director of orthoplasty at Plymouth Hospitals. This is the uh, a GMC recognized certificate saying that I was qualified uh, doing this fellowship in knee orthoplasty and using computers. In recognition of excellence in knee surgery, I was in fact nicknamed Sri the Knee. And uh, here is a morph picture of me with a cricket bat in my right hand because of my passion for cricket and a revision knee implant on the left hand because of my passion for knee surgery. My second fellowship was with uh, Dr. Everett Smith in Avon Orthopedic Center, Bristol, UK. Everett is a uh, UK head of European Hip Society and is a director of world famous Bristol Hip Orthoplasty course. And I'm again fortunate to bring this course live from UK again for all the orthopedic surgeons in India and Southeast Asia end of November. And I also work with Mr. Anthony Ward, director of pelvic establisher uh, reconstructive surgery in the Southwest of UK. Uh, this is Mr. Edward Smith uh, doing the first uh, uh, minimally invasive approach called spare approach uh, of hip in India. It's me and him in All India Institute of Medical Science, New Delhi uh, a few years ago. And, uh, you know, on the right hand side is uh, Mr. Robert Smith uh, being felicitated uh, in traditional Karnataka style. And I got my uh, proud teachers uh, standing next to me. This is my third fellowship uh, in endoclinic uh, Hamburg, Germany with Prof. Gurkha. He's a big name. He's a guru of septic revision uh, surgery. That is uh, infected revision where the implant is taken out. Uh, in the same single sitting and a, a new non-infected implant is put in the same sitting. These are very complex uh, surgeries lasting for nearly three to five hours and uh, it's definitely not for the untrained because uh, you know you need to have a lot of patients to be doing these surgeries and he's, these kind of complex surgeries are done in only few units across the world. Very proud to have worked with this person, uh, Dr. Richard Parkinson, my mentor, my inspira inspiration for knee surgery. This was my first job way back in 1999, uh, 2000, uh, when I did my first job with him. He was uh, president of the British Knee Society, voted top 10 best knee replacement surgeons in the UK. And uh, very strangely, my first job itself uh, as a very junior doctor, I started doing knee replacement, uh, revision knee replacement because uh, he had a big revision load and uh, I've been doing revision since 1999. That's sort of, uh, although I'm quite young, it makes me quite a veteran really. Also uh, trained with Dr. Frederick Lord. Uh, he's a pioneer of, uh, you know, anterior approach to hip replacement, which is the approach from the front of the hip. And uh, he has done around 4,000 cases. And uh, he's in uh, Tours, uh, just south of Paris, actually, in France. And uh, this is Dr. Lord, and he's an amazing surgeon. I mean, say, uh, you know, when you're watching him operate, he just, he's operating, and then he has got one scrub nurse with him and that's it. He takes around 45 to 50 minutes to do a hip replacement surgery and there's absolutely no assistance for him. So unbelievable person. This is at the academic workshop which he conducts. I'm uh, flanked by one of uh, my Belgian colleagues and a South African colleague and uh, practicing the anterior approach. Uh, I also worked with uh, surgeons with extensive revision training with Zimmer surgeons. Uh, Prof. Wayne Proposky is a big man uh, in Zimmer world uh, and revision surgery. In fact, we use classification based on his name. Uh, and also Dr. Lawrence O'Hara, big name in UK in Bournemouth, 
and uh, he is known to use a lot of these trabeculometal augments and one surgery is used up to 12 which is a record uh, in the world and Jeremy Latham he is my boss friend uh, in Newcastle so this is with uh, Lawrence O'Hara when I went to visit him uh, doing a complex surgery which took nearly six hours and this is with Jeremy Latham uh, my boss's friend really in Newcastle when I was doing a course with him. Coming to today's topic we are going to talk about knee and hip arthritis uh, you know, uh, as you know, arthritis uh, affects around uh, 20 million uh, people uh, in India. So affecting the knee and the hip problem, uh, knee more than the hip in India. So almost like one in five Indians are affected with this uh, particular condition. 25% uh, of them, that is around one in four, will need some kind of surgical intervention in their lifetime. And, uh, you know, uh, there is a big skill shortage in India. So I think before the pandemic, a lot of my junior colleagues used to tell, oh, Dr. Srikant, there are too many doctors and too many surgeons in India, and there's a cutthroat competition, this and that and everything. And what the second wave really proved to us is that we really don't have enough doctors in the country. You know, uh, we all saw what happened in second wave, how we lost so many people, unfortunately. And that clearly shows that uh, there's a great skill shortage in India for trained doctors. Uh, uh, in the country and hence what's happened is you know every trained and untrained uh, you know surgeon is at uh, these procedures and in the robotic and computer assisted surgery there's a saying garbage in is garbage out that is if we input things wrongly then the outcome of the surgery is also quite bad uh, the basic rule in orthoplasty that is joint replacement surgery is if you fail to prepare for surgery you prepare to fail for surgery and this is exemplified by this picture here it's a hip replacement done, which is actually dislocated uh, centrally uh, second day after surgery. And who really wants such an outcome? Nobody wants really. Coming to knee, what exactly is this arthritis? Uh, knee is called as a complex three-dimensional hinge. Uh, all of us have seen our doors, you know, they open and close. Uh, they've got a, they're called a hinge joint, uh, open and close in a single plane. But just imagine your door that you open for your you know, house rotating as well you know how complex the joint should be for your door to not only open and close but also rotate which the knee does and hence it's called as a complex three-dimensional hinge when we encounter a, a a patient with a knee problem and a knee pain we basically ask these simple questions what is causing the knee pain so we also go on asking you know what is the age of the patient where whether there was a injury involved a traumatic event involved what is the site of the pain? Where exactly is the pain coming from the knee? Did the symptoms come suddenly or it came over course of time? Once these questions are answered, we can begin to investigate the symptoms. Putting the symptoms together with examination often leads to a diagnosis. And, um, you know, I can't stress the importance of this examination, uh, you know, uh, because when I moved from England, I had a patient who came to my center uh, I think nearly around six uh, years ago. And this gentleman had told me, Dr. Srikant, look here, I've met all the top doctors in the country and I've got all the latest uh, scans done. So in fact, he had a PET scan done. He had an MRI of the spine done and he had met all big, big names. He told me, he met neurosurgeons and everything. And he said, still I'm suffering with uh, this pain in the hip and back. You know, I don't know why it's coming. All that I had to do is put him in the couch uh, in my center and examine his hip. And I saw that there was no movement in the hip. And I sent, sent him for a very simple investigation like x-ray, which cost around 200 rupees, maybe even less at that time. And that gave me the diagnosis that, you know, his hip, uh, you know, uh, had sort of uh, begun to collapse, you know, what is called as avascular necrosis. And uh, you really didn't need a PET scan and an MRI of the spine or a neurosurgery input to diagnose that. So I think, you know, very important to start with simple things, uh, less expensive things like examination and cheap tests like x-ray before we jump on to expensive investigations like MRI and PET scan. So uh, the basic points with me is that, you know, uh, if there's a pain while we are walking down the steps, it's very commonly due to problems with our kneecap called as chondromalacia or softening of the kneecap. The pain which comes in the morning with stiffness, which resolves with gentle activity over the course of time, typical of early arthritis of the knee. If we get sharp pain with clicking, locking of the joint where it gets jammed and uh, it's commonly due to damage to the cartilage called the meniscus or an kneecap problem or a loose fragment within the joint. If there is a pop also, you know, in the knee associated with sudden swelling of the knee and sort of giving way where you can't trust your knee and it uh, falls on you, then it is, particularly in the young people, it is due to damage to the ligaments, you know, cruciate ligaments, ACL or PCL, these things. So 
uh, these are the these are the typical symptoms one need to look for and uh, you know we can start to investigate and then come to a diagnosis any of the rheumatological disease like inflammatory arthropathy what we call as uh, sandhivayu in kannada may also commence as an isolated form of uh, you know arthritis of the knee it may start from knee and go on to other joints these are the basic investigations that we do you see the x ray here on the left hand side a joint which is good looking and on the right hand side you see that the bone is touching on bone and that's what we call as uh, arthritis and simple tests we do like a blood test we do and we look at the weight bearing x rays like this ap and lateral and skyline and uh, sometimes we get an x ray of the whole leg like from the hip to the knee to the ankle uh, if there is sort of a, a bowing of the leg or if there is a previous fracture if the patient is 6 feet tall or maybe 3 and 1/2 to 4 feet short then we have to get these special uh, tests done as well and we do various measurements on the x ray as i said uh, unless you plan you don't uh, you know plan the surgery on the table but plan before only you know what you need to be doing so what are the treatment options and principles it's the same for hip and knee problems so the basic principles are that if there is arthritis we basically uh, look at if there is any lifestyles that can be modified we look at if the patient is obese we ask them to reduce weight then we say you know uh, if uh, he's not using a walking stick we'll say we use a walking stick or a cane uh, that might offload the joint and reduce pain then we start with a simple who has given something called as analgesic ladder so we basically start with simple tablets like you know paracetamol you know we don't start with complex uh, and uh, and then we move on if paracetamol doesn't work then we we move on to the next step in the ladder which is uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory like a brufen or a diclofenac you know a cyclofenac that kind of thing if that doesn't work we move to next higher which is a tramadol then next higher would be morphine based uh, drugs really so this is how we typically treat both hip and knee arthritis with tablets and if all these things fail then we say okay let's inject the knee we inject the knee with uh, you know steroids uh, that injection is happening for nearly more than 100 years and uh, the latest thing is the prp which is called platelet rich plasma where we take uh, the patient's own blood spin it in a centrifuge get this very good uh, healing stuff we inject into the knee that uh, seems to take the pain away and we have artificial synovial fluid you know uh, and we sort of inject that i did a big research in uk on this and published it a uh, randomized controlled trial published it in european knee surgery journal uh, before i moved to india and uh, in the last two years stem cells have come in a big way we take uh, you know blood from the bone marrow or sometimes even from the fat really abdominal fat and then we grow stem cells and we inject into the knee and that seems to give uh, you know a uh, prolonged relief of pain and uh, you know that's also catching up in the last one or two years these procedures can be repeated few times in a year so treatment for uh, arthritis of the knee is similar to that of hip so physiotherapy becomes a very very important you know uh, to the regain control of the muscles and uh, decrease pain and uh, newer approved uh, uh, things like offloader knee brace that can be used to offload uh, uh, the weight bearing and pain coming from a particular area of the joint and uh, we can use insoles which are simple and cheap uh, methods to you know decrease pain and we have this uh, magnetic treatment as uh, as well which is becoming popular i would say srikant is a more expert in this uh, rather than me and uh, you know he worked with one of the company who used to do these magnetic uh, devices so uh, you know this is also you know popularly in the vogue uh, recently uh, this is an important slide you know what is the effect of covid on arthritic patients really and i think uh, this is important because we have something called covid delta so where there is no fever no cough and the patient gets a typical dengue or chikungunya like joint pain and if you do rt pcr it comes positive for covid so you know we can't you know anybody coming with knee pain now we have to rule out covid because that's the big monster in the room which is waiting so you know uh, then arthritis can lead to <clears throat> less movement <clears throat> even lockdown can lead to less movement then that can lead to osteoporosis which is weakening of the bones and that can lead to a fracture of the hip and for the fractured hip the treatment of choice uh other right treatment now in 2021 is hip replacement surgery uh it's uh, amazing how this happens uh, recently i had a friend uh, in hyderabad whose dad fell down and you know he broke his hip is very active person uh, in in his 70s i told him hip replacement is the right surgery but uh, even though he was quite good friend he worked with me in the uk he was not a doctor 
uh, he sort of ended up with a half hip replacement surgery in uh, in Hyderabad, which is a very commonly done operation, but they usually need to revision surgery, a difficult revision in three or four years time. So this is a fairly common thing in India, but uh, you know, you know, we can only pray that these things will change in the future. And the COVID lockdown can't go for walk, worsens arthritis, increase increase obesity and osteoporosis, and then you know. Uh, it makes the whole thing quite difficult, really. Uh, there was a study done in the West uh, last year during the peak of the lockdown, and the patients said uh, they looked at the quality of life of patients, Western patients. They said that being bed bound is worse than dying, really. So this is what the Western people uh, said. So it's quite interesting how they feel about it compared to the Indian patients. And uh, you know, with proper protocol, my boss uh, in Germany, uh, he managed to do 5,000 uh, knee and hip replacement surgeries with zero infection rate of COVID. So this is, you know, it is possible, even if the third wave comes, you know, it is still possible, but I think it's got to do with the leadership because I was very close to all the top leaders in Bangalore and some of the leaders of the corporates, I really appreciate them, they're really good, but even they got really their hands twisted by the political bosses during the second wave and they had to shut their hospital and they say, you know, if you have 10 hospitals, uh, make all of them COVID, now they were forced. So I think, you know, yeah, this is the practical reality. So there are many types of non-knee uh, replacement surgery. You don't need to always uh, do a knee replacement surgery for knee pain. Uh, you know, one can start with a simple procedure like what we call as a diagnostic orthoscopy, where we put a small telescope into the knee, see what is going on. And then if there's a trouble or uh, damage to the meniscus, that cartilage, we can trim that or repair that. Or if there's a loss of cartilage, we can drill multiple holes into it called microfracture, which fills with a, a different type of cartilage called a fibrocartilage. Or if there is a loss of cartilage completely, we can take cartilage from a non-weight bearing area, put it called Wurtz grafting, or we can take the cartilage, grow it in a petri dish in a lab. Then six weeks later, we can come back and do what is called artificial contact slide uh, implantation. So our Macy or AC. And if we go inside the knee, we see that the ligament is damaged like ACL, PCL or PLC, postulateral coral, we can replace that. You all would have heard about ACL replacement surgery, which is quite popular. Coming to knee replacement, uh, the indications uh, for knee replacement, you know, mainly osteoarthrosis, 96%, uh, inflammatory arthropathy or Sandhivayu type, 3%, post-traumatic, less than 1%. Average age is around 67. Srikant mentioned a lot of uh, his flatmate might uh, join who are basically females. So yes, you know, female preponderance is more than males because they got increased the inflammatory orthopathy conditions compared to men. So, and the average age, as I mentioned, is around 67 really. So there are many types of knee replacement surgery. You don't need to do a full knee replacement surgery all the time. So the knee has what we call three different uh, compartments, uh, the medial or the inside compartments. If it's damaged, we can replace that. If the outside compartment is damaged, we can do a lateral uni. If the kneecap is damaged, we can replace the kneecap called patellofemoral replacement. And these are becoming uh, popular in the last few years in India, but I've been doing this for nearly 20 years. They are, do good procedures, they have good procedures and uh, they, there's specific indication to do them. But if all the three compartments are damaged, then you have to do a total knee replacement. So what is new in knee surgery? The new is computer navigated surgery, uh, robotic surgery and 3D augmented surgery and patient specific implants. I do all four of them and I do them in Bangalore as well. And these, all these modern techniques lead to predictable accuracy, make surgery safe for the patient and recordable. And, uh, you know, data, as you all know, is the new gold, really. So I, during my fellowship, did 600 navigation surgery. The data has been collected and it will be analyzed and it's going to really help us in the future, next 5, 10, 15 years, you know, how do we perform surgeries in future? And this prepares better surgeons of tomorrow, leads to a bit of transparency <clears throat> in the practice future learning, as I mentioned, and better surgeons, and also a bit of accountability because we can see the data and see that everything has happened uh, properly. And these modern techniques also will act like a patient-specific implants. We now know in 2021 that not all of our knees are the same. You know, if you are five, six people in a room, then, you know, each of our knee got us made uniquely. You know, all of us can, can't have a size eight uh, slippers or shoes given to us you know we are all different and we have to you know have measure of our feet and then use the slippers you know giving size eight for all is uh, not correct this is a picture of a knee replacement how it looks uh, inside and this is one of the post-operative x-rays of a knee uh, done using advanced technology like robotics 
Uh, when I moved to India, there were a lot of common myths and practice that I had to encounter. One of the myths was that uh, eyeballing, you know, was better than computer navigation or robotics. Uh, I think we can ask our children and our grandchildren, and they will tell us, oh, daddy or granddad, uh, no, computers are definitely more accurate. Robots are uh, definitely more accurate. So I, I think this debate is really settled now because uh, we live in a digital world where these things are, uh, you know, we are using it on a day-to-day -day basis, really. And second, as I mentioned, one size fits all. The truth is every knee is unique. So we need to do a surgery specific to that patient, not giving a size eight shoe or a slipper to all our patients. And looking at x-ray and doing a knee replacement only means giving a two-dimensional solution to what knee is a three-dimensional problem. Look at your own knees. It's a three-dimensional structure. It's got length, uh, you know, width and girth. You know, Three things are there. It's not like x-ray. We are not like... Uh, we are not like a, uh, we, we can't be drawn on an A4 sheet. You know, we are three-dimensional structures, really. So we need to give a three-dimensional solution. And you can always plan surgery on the table. Sorry, I don't agree with that. You have to plan surgery before, uh, you know, the, uh, the time. And then operation table is a place to execute the plan, not to plan the surgery. The second uh, myth that I, had, I faced when I came to India is that, uh, you know, uh, anybody can do a knee and hip replacement, a very common myth in many developing uh, countries. Apples are not oranges, you know, apples are apples, oranges are ap uh, oranges. Uh, very strangely, even my, uh, I did a audit in, uh, uh, for my UK trainees in the UK uh, survey, and they also said uh, that it's very easy to do a knee replacement. They said, Mr. Srikant, what's so great about it? Just open the knee joint, put the jig, cut the bone, bang this implant and close it up, big deal. So, uh, you know, but, you know, one needs to be honest, uh, you know, to self. Uh, Shrikant said a lot of his Gita group were uh, joining uh, to this webinar. And uh, honesty is very, very important. Honesty to the self. And uh, like uh, Lord Sri Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, uh, yoga is karmeshu kaushalam. That means skill in action is yoga. And if you're doing a really good job, a perfect kind of job, then showing a skill that itself is uh, yoga really. So, and uh, people may think, you know, particularly some of the Meta says, oh, Chennai is Singapore or Bangalore is Singapore. But we know what is the reality. When I take my two-wheeler, go in Jainagar for a shopping within two, three kilometers, you know, sometimes I'm scared whether I'm going to come back alive or not, you know, because there's so much of portals, you know. In fact, I call Bangalore as Portaluru. And, uh, you know, that is the reality. And we need to be honest to ourselves where we are really. This is an interesting picture, you know. This is uh, in 1996, the... Uh, Bangalore Hyderabad Highway, you can see how it was in 2016, how it's become a motorway. But look at the health, the government hospital in 1996 and in 2016, you know, uh, absolutely no difference. So I think, you know, health needs a lot of uh, investment and we need to be really honest with where we are. Then only we can improve and we can, uh, you know, we, okay, our generation is done, but, you know, our children, grandchildren, they deserve a better India. And I think we need to really focus on that and be realistic than, you know, thinking that, oh, we are the best. So why this is uh, coming is because John Insall is the father of knee replacement surgery at Hospital of Specialist Surgery. In 1970s, he made this comment that knee replacement is a soft tissue operation with some bony cuts. And uh, he didn't say like my registrars in UK that, uh, you know, it's a bony operation, anybody can do it. So he said it was a soft tissue operation. And this is the, you know, we are still debating in 2021, you know, what he has said nearly, you know, 40 years ago. And uh, he said this because he understood the nature and the role of the ligaments in the knee. So this is uh, what the knee ligaments do. It's a very complex uh, slide. So I'll try to make it very simple. Uh, the movement of the leg bone on the thigh bone, the tibia on the femur, you know, is controlled by what we call anterior cruciate ligament. But it's also controlled by the capsule of the knee and the other ligaments. So similarly, you know, the posterior movement is controlled by posterior cruciate ligament, but there are multiple ligaments controlling it. That means to say each movement of the knee is controlled by multiple ligaments. And hence the role of ligaments in 2021, we understand only 70% and 30% still we don't know what the ligaments are doing in the knee. This is what, you know, what we call a six degrees of freedom of the knee. The knee, as I mentioned, is a complex three-dimensional pinch and it has got these movements. That is in bending, it can move side to side in the top left. Or if you are standing, it can rotate. Uh, standing, it can compress and distract. But if you are bending, it can also rotate. Or it can slide down like a ball slides on a uh, on an incline. Or it can open and close like a door, a typical door hinge, you know, on the bottom right picture. And to do a knee replacement as a surgeon, I need to do three basic cuts. That is, you know, a cut on the thigh bone, cut on the you know leg bone, and a cut on the kneecap. 
If I combine these three cards with six degrees of uh, freedom that the knee has, then there are 215 ways in which a senior orthopedic surgeon can get a knee replacement wrong. You know, what to say of a, a junior orthopedic surgeon, really. So I've really answered the question, if anybody can do a knee replacement, it's a clear no, if you have patient's interest at your heart. There's a saying uh, that primum non non say that is must do no harm. This is a fundamental principle of ethics. And I always tell my juniors, if in doubt, ask. This is absolutely no shame in asking. You know, so I have proper training and experiences must to do these procedures. And hence, these modern concepts like navigation, PSI, 3D, knee, and robotics have come as well. You know why this is the best guy in the world? Because uh, you know he what he has done. You know, it is recordable. You know, it's Usain Bolt and he has done the world record for both 100, 200 meters, still stands unbroken. So, so you can record what he's done. So that's why he's the best. What are the limitations of the human eye? H human eye, that is eyeballing, can't differentiate less than 10 degrees change in, you know, this kind of angulation, you know, what we call various valg valgus angulation when you stand straight. And we know that in knee replacement surgery, if more than six degrees change in this alignment, various valgus angulation occurs, it leads to a failure of the knee replacement surgery. And we don't want a bad day at office to affect the outcome of our patient surgery because we are human beings. We can have good and bad days in life. We want to minimize surgeon error when so many factors are at play, some known and many unknown, like the ligaments role in the knee. And one millimeter accuracy is almost humanly impossible. And uh, you know some of the issues in 2021 are still unresolved whether alignment is important or the balance so there's a need for these modern technologies there are a number of varieties of that i'll not go into the details of that but i'll tell you why the change had to come because historically we thought knee was just our door it opens and closes like a 2d hinge then they go went on to a complex uh, you know jaker kinematics that's how it moves and now we have got uh, you know what what we say uh, this yellow line trans epicondral axis and the green line trans cylindrical axis which is a new concept and most of the surgeons in the world uh, maybe 80 percent put the implant parallel to the yellow line but those who believe in 3d surgery like myself we put it parallel to the you know green line and that, that's probably explains uh, why 20% of knee surgeries in the world are a little bit uh, uh, dissatisfied. They are not uh, perfectly happy, but uh, you know others are happy. So that's uh, you know we have to aim for the green line really. So how is this modern technology done? We get a model of the knee with advanced technology like CT or MRI. We get an arthritic and a planning model, and then <clears throat> these custom jigs are prepared, taking all the six degrees of freedom that I mentioned in the account. And uh, then they are put uh, on the knee on the time of surgery and those cuts are made, uh, taking the six degrees of freedom into account. <clears throat> All of them, these modern technologies, whether it's patient specific or robotic or uh, computer assisted surgery at 3D, they all follow the same uh, principle really. So where surgeon you know, looks at, gets an uh, advanced scanning like MRI or CT that's went, uh, that goes to the company. Company plans looking at all the six degrees freedom. So they sort of uh, creates uh, these kind of jigs to cut or the robot sort of creates a virtual plan in the operation theater and says, okay, this is how the knee is. This is how you have to do the cut. This is how the balancing occurs. So basically you are essentially doing a virtual surgery before the real surgery and looking at the balance, how predictable balance, how it will be when the virtual implants are pulled. And then the definitive surgery is done. So now the modern concept is that you sort of do a surgery before surgery and then the actual surgery is done. So either using robot or using the computers uh, or these jigs. I started doing robotics in Bangalore since uh, the beginning of this year. It really gives one millimeter accuracy. This is my picture from the first robotic surgery, uh, not uh, far from where I stay. And uh, here the bone cuts are made, uh, taking six degrees of freedom into account. And uh, this leads to less soft tissue dissection and uh, you know less pain for the patient, less blood loss, and uh, there's no need for the blood transfusion. I'm, uh, you know, every time I'm surprised that uh, my own transfusion rate has come down with use of the robot. Uh, early rehabilitation is possible. These patients are able to uh, lift the leg uh, straight up, you know, uh, quite easily. And uh, you know, early discharge is also happening for these patients. And uh, you know, Dr. Kaper was the creator of this robot. And then, you know, you can see in the bottom on this uh, picture on the left-hand side, there's a line which is straight line and there's a, a, a orange and a, a blue kind of uh, boxes, which are, uh, you know, almost perfectly aligned. And uh, I think this shows a perfect soft tissue balance. And this is objective evidence 
of the perfect soft tissue balance uh, throughout the range of the knee. And, uh, you know, even Dr. Kaper should be very proud of this uh, result, which I got in the very first surgery. Uh, and this is the first time in our history of orthoplasty, we are able to objectively measure the soft tissue balance. You know, this was not that even in computer surgery, you are not able to get this objective evidence. I used to say, my knee is more balanced than yours. And somebody would say, his knee is more balanced. It was all hearsay. But now we've got to prove that this knee is a definitely well-balanced knee. So this is incredible. And this is one of the x-rays uh, done, you know, using the similar kind of technology. And this is one of the patient, uh, you know, uh, following robotic surgery, how she's able to lift straight after surgery, the knee straight up. Uh, and then she's able to also bend the knee up to sort of 100 uh, degrees or 80 degrees bend. And this happens because of a good, uh, you know, uh, soft tissue dissection, uh, which is improved because of the robot and advanced technologies. As I say, the future is now. So the future is this uh, uh, advanced technologies. The advantages are enhanced accuracy, reduced bleeding, probably reduced cost because, uh, you know, the revision burden, uh, you know, the revision, as you see in the later part of my presentation, costs quite a lot. So if you reduce the revision surgeries, then definitely the cost for the patient is reduced. Minimally invasive surgery is possible now. And these needs are almost patient specific and less tissue is cut, less, less pain and less blood loss and faster rehabilitation and early home for all these patients. And this is leading to better function and what is called as a forgotten knee, which was the holy uh, grail, what we are looking as surgeons. So basically, you know, uh, uh, when the knee is put, uh, patients sometimes feel that there's an artificial implant, but we are reaching a stage where the patient can forget that there is an artificial implant. So I just pause a little bit uh, for uh, any sort of questions uh, here really. And then uh, I'll uh, go on to the, some of the complex uh, surgeries that uh, I got involved. Uh, so maybe I think, uh, you know, what I'll do is I will uh, just share a video of uh, how a knee surgery is done really. And uh, once that is done, then uh, we can sort of uh, uh, go back and uh, continue with the further presentation. So I'll just see if I can uh, stop share. Dr. Shrikant, Dr. Shrikant, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can, can you stop yeah, here? Yeah. Is it possible, Shrikant? No, no, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, uh, we'll wait, we'll wait for your video to be on uh, uh, for a while. Okay. Uh, since there are very few people, I thought it's 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 fair to kind of allow people to unmute themselves and ask some questions if they have. Yeah, yeah, they could do that. Yeah, they could do that. So let's let's get some questions. Uh, would you think it is it is the right time to have the questions now or uh, after the video? Uh, I mean, so I thought I'll just show the video then they understand what is a knee replacement because nice okay. animation and then okay. uh, they can always uh, ask questions. It's not an issue. So you I'll can go ahead. Stop here. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Actually, Srikant, I think it makes a lot more sense uh, after we have gone through the entire session. Yeah. You know, then asking questions. Uh, would be more logical uh, yeah. because I may be uh, preempting a lot of things. I may have my own uh, paradigm. So fair enough, fair enough. So so we'll allow him to finish his video and uh, maybe the talk on the knee part, and then we'll take some questions on the knee, and then maybe he would also like to take us through the hip as well. Yeah, right. sure, sure. Yeah. Okay, so, Doctor Shikant. So please continue. Okay, I'll just continue. We'll come back to the video later. So this is uh, uh, my sort of uh, experience with some challenging patients uh, in India. So uh, this is a, a patient, uh, you know, I did in Banshankri in a hospital which was uh, newly built. Shrikan knows this hospital. And, uh, you know, the lady uh, was an obese lady and uh, she had to undergo a bariatric surgery to reduce weight really. And then only uh, knee surgery was possible. And I used uh, computer uh, navigation for this uh, patient in a small hospital. So, and this is the result she got, her knee was straight and she could bend 90 degrees uh, uh, the very next day. So this goes on to uh, prove a point that uh, you don't need a big corporate to do this advanced surgeries really. It can be done in a smaller uh, unit as well. So this is uh, one point I want to drive. Uh, this is another lady uh, where surgery was done, where immediate post-op, she was able to uh, lift the leg straight up and also bend the knee up to sort of 90 degrees. And this occurs because of two things. One is a meticulous kind of, uh, you know, the surgical steps. And second is uh, a great anesthetic. So we, can, we can't forget our colleagues. 
anesthetic colleagues who are uh, fantastic. They come with all these modern uh, blocks like a rectal canal block, which really allows the patient to immediately uh, lift the leg and their patients can stand now immediately after surgery. And uh, some of my colleagues, you know, make them sort of uh, do a little bit of movement as well, uh, you know, and it's called a dancing knee replacement in Mumbai. And it's quite uh, popular really in, uh, you know, in Western India as such. So um, coming to more complex and challenging surgeries, uh, what I say is uh, differentiating men from boys. Uh, this was a 60 year old uh, lady. She was 120 kg diabetic. She was operated by uh, the top two uh, joint replacement surgeon of Karnataka really, very experienced surgeon. Unfortunately, the joint got infected and the uh, surgeon tried to salvage it. He did five more surgeries on her and uh, you know it was not successful. And then he said, okay, I'm going to give up. So he gave up. So, uh, so she was left without a joint actually. And uh, without a joint, she was in a, a better state. And uh, you know, uh, her daughter came to me sort of two years after uh, uh, this uh, date really. And uh, she said, Dr. Shrikant, can you really help me? You know, uh, this is my mom and uh, you know, this is what she had done. And then, uh, you know, she's better done. I got a disabled sister, I look after her. So I got two disabled people in the house and I'm really struggling. I said, uh, okay, not to worry. This is my training in Germany and UK. Let's see what could be done. And uh, you know, so basically she had this implant on the left-hand side in the first surgery. And this is how on the right-hand side, uh, she came without a joint. The issues that she had was obesity, which I mentioned, uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, you know, she was diabetic. Uh, she had five failed surgeries uh, previously and she had multiple scars. You can see some of the scars are marked in the blue pen there. And, uh, you know, and one, and one of the last surgeries, the primary surgeon was not able to close the wound. So he had called his uh, plastic surgical colleague to bail him out and the plastic surgeon had come and he did, uh, you know, what is called as a gastronomous flap. There is a, a, there is a muscle in the cough called gastronomous. It has two heads. He had used one of the heads to uh, cover the wound and then close it up. And I knew that if I get into trouble, you know, they would this surgery, then I have only one head of the gastronomias available for me to close the wound really. So you always have to plan in advance, you know, what are the challenges you're going to get. And there's a gross shortening also of one inch. I'm showing that in the, I put my hand there, you know, compared to right leg, left leg is one inch short. And she needed a bariatric table and she needed a bold anesthetic to take her on. So we planned, uh, aspirated the knee, that is we grew some samples out and it grew a bacteria called E. coli. Uh, we got an antibiogram, which antibiotic is going to kill the bacteria. So we planned a, a revision in two stages and uh, we put an antibiotic loaded, the cement spacer, the white thing you see in between, uh, which uh, sort of killed the bacteria within the joint actually. And uh, after around six to eight weeks time, her ESR and CRP, which all of us are familiar with uh, thanks to COVID, came back to normal, showing that the inflammation was down. Uh, further aspiration didn't grow any bacteria. So I had to plan the second stage of surgery. So I had to decide which hospital to use. The teamwork was a combined plastic surgery and orthopedic uh, input, which is myself and my plastic surgical colleague. So I had to get clearance in this big hospital from the senior physician, the nephrologist, cardiologist, senior vascular surgeon, senior anesthetist, really. Then only I had to proceed. So the challenges during second surgery was that uh, type of anesthesia was a challenge. It was a prolonged surgery lasting for four and a half to five hours. And I keep telling my juniors, you know, uh, one can run out of steam after two and a half, three hours of these complex procedures and you feel that, you know, let's close the wound and get out of theater. So unless you're trained, we should not really venture into these complex surgeries. I keep telling my fellows also the same thing. And uh, there was a massive fluid uh, shift because of five hours surgery. And quite rightly, she was uh, put in ICU for a day. And as promised to me, the senior anesthetist uh, extubated her, put her back into the ward next day. And there's issues with the quality of quadriceps, which is a muscle in the thigh bone, so which I had to deal with. And after many more challenges, uh, this implant on the right was put. And, uh, you know, this is what she did. You know, she was able to walk nearly 2.5 years after a bedridden state. People say doctors operate for money, but, you know, this gives me more satisfaction, you know, than the money the patient can give. I've made enough money in England, don't mistake me, but, uh, you know, uh, this, is, this is more satisfying than the money that the uh, patient really pays. So coming to uh, next uh, patient, uh, you know, in men versus boys too, this is another 50 year old lady, again, not walked for two years. She was literally carried by her son to my center. 
you know, in the hand, actually. She was not a very petite lady. And uh, this reminded me of this uh, uh, Indian tradition, uh, Sanat Kumar, where he used to carry his uh, two blind parents for pilgrimage, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of, uh, you know, two bhutis, really, uh, you know, all around. Uh, that's how the son brought this lady into the center. Uh, the lady was seen by a very respected professor of uh, orthopedic surgery in Bangalore. Uh, and he was uh, my professor's professor, Professor Ayer. In fact, he happens to be the father-in-law of the present uh, Indian Orthopedic Association president. So uh, he had said, uh, you know, God help you. And uh, one of my colleagues had aspirated the knees, uh, taken some samples, nothing was grown. And she basically came with, uh, you know, fixed flexion deformities, 90 degrees. That means the knee was stuck like this, you know, at 90 degrees, you know, neither it would move like that, nor it would move like that. Okay. So I got an MR scan of the knee done. It showed complete destruction of the joint uh, and there's pus right from hip all the way to the knee and the ankle. So I had to plan, you know, uh, stage surgery. So I opened up the joint, there was frank pus in the knee. So I had to clear all the uh, thing, pus and all the debris which was there. And uh, then I had to put an antibiotic loaded uh, cement spacer, I had to wash all the way to the hip and the ankle uh, from the knee joint. And I sent for all the investigation possible to find out what exactly was causing a problem. And quite surprisingly, all the investigation came negative. So even I was like, you know, uh, bounced really with this. And uh, thanks to my training, I sent a sample to one of my friend, Dr. Prasad, who is a histopathologist at Rangodari Hospital. He called me next day, he said, Srikant, this is classical tuberculosis. So then I started the lady on uh, anti-tubercular treatment, ATT, what we call. And uh, as you see, the bone was a paper thin quality. And the patient said, uh, sir, you know, we are not very rich people. We can't afford a revision knee implant, which was around three and a half, four lakhs at that time. And, uh, you know, kindly fuse the knee they requested. And even the knee fusion uh, implants are around one and a half to two lakhs. So I had to think about Juga, the Atma Nirbal Bharat, even at that time. And I got a customized nailing done from Ahmedabad for 10, 15,000 rupees. Uh, for this patient and put this nail and the knee went on to fusion uh, in around six months time with the help of ATT. So I think before I go on to the, uh, you know, the hip talk, I just like to show how, uh, you know, a knee replacement really looks and how a hip replacement also looks. And then we'll take questions on the knee. Then sort of we will go back to the hip talk really. So this is an animated video of uh, how a knee replacement is done actually. So uh, I'll just play this. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, Shrikant, are you able to see the, the bone and shin bone are removed? Then they replace. Uh, Shrikant, I'll just share this. Uh, doctor, sorry, I, I couldn't log in earlier. Ah, no worries, uh, Heman. No worries. Welcome. Welcome. Sorry, so, uh, uh, I new phone has some problems, so I had to log in from computer. So. Okay, no worries. No worries. My, uh, you know, my friend and my patient, uh, Mr. Heman, has joined. So Great. We'll just uh, talk to him a little bit later. So welcome, Mr. Hemant. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, you so, can unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. You can please delay. unmute yourself. I've, I've done it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this is. Uh, let me go back. Uh, Shikan, I hope you can see the animation. Yes, I can. Yeah. So this is what a knee replacement uh, looks like. What we really do. Uh, and uh, yeah. So let's go through this. In knee replacement surgery, the damaged parts of the thigh bone and shin bone are removed, then they're replaced with metal and plastic implants. The procedure starts with necessary incisions, then precision guides and instruments are used to remove the damaged surfaces and prepare the bones to accept the implants. Then the new implants are put in where the damaged bone surfaces used to be. Once the implants are in place, they are checked, and when the surgeon is satisfied, the incision is closed and covered with dressings. So essentially, knee uh, replacement is a uh, sort of a, you know knee resurfacing. So many patients ask me, sir, uh, then and bare knee uh, do you, uh, uh, you know sort of cut and throw our knee in the bin? So nothing like that. We basically take the damaged surface out, and then uh, taking the damaged surface out, we sort of uh, uh, go and uh, put a, uh, a you know the sort of metallic surface back ready. So. Uh, that's what is uh, all about knee replacement. I'll just uh, check if there is a video on the hip replacement. I'll just try to play that. And then uh, we can sort of uh, go to the question and answers.
Just give me a second. Yeah, yeah, take your time. Perhaps you might prefer to have a cup of uh, tea or maybe some yeah, water. Yeah, just play while while I'm playing. I'll have it. <laughs> This is a hit experiment, so I'll just uh, let me share. Actually, sorry. So, I know because because you've been talking for more than about forty five minutes. So yeah. So this is how a hit experiment is done. Uh, Heman knows all about it. Uh, I'll just uh, you know share this. Uh, yeah. In hip replacement surgery, the damaged parts of your hip are replaced with implants consisting of three components: a socket, ball, and stem. The procedure starts with necessary incisions over the side of your hip. The ball end of your thigh bone is cut and replaced with the new metal ball and stem component. The damaged surface of the socket is smoothed in preparation for the insertion of the new socket. Then the ball and socket are joined. Once the surgeon is satisfied with the fit and function, the incision is closed and covered with dressings. Okay, so that's that. So I think what we'll do is we will uh, uh, take any questions uh, uh, which the participants have. Then I'll unmute uh, uh, Hemant and I'll ask him his experience. Uh, so he might have other things to do. He had a very busy meeting today. And uh, thanks to him for uh, really uh, coming and joining us. Uh, so let me sort of uh, go back to my uh, last slide. I guess I unmuted. I guess I have unmuted everybody. So, so yeah. yeah. Any questions in the chat box, uh, Shrikant? Any questions on the chat box so far? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. So, anybody wants to ask, please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, then, you know, I'll ask uh, Hemant a few questions. Yeah, Ankita, please go ahead with your question. Ankita, you can go ahead. Venkat. Okay, Venkat, just a I'm moment. Unmute, they're saying. So maybe yeah, you yeah. Have all yeah, yeah, you can unmute now yourself, Venkat. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you no, know, Ankita, if she's asking, I'll wait. No, I think Ankita raised. Her hand, yes, sir. I'll, uh, can I ask? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, so I have got many information from this uh, knee replacement, and uh, actually my mother is uh, now of the age thirty eight. So if she sit for uh, some work or if she do puja in the puja room, uh, when she get up, no, uh, she get some uh, sounds in her knee. Uh, so I don't know what's the problem. Sir. Can you tell? Yeah. So basically, you know, uh, uh, what we need to differentiate is, uh, you know, you say that she's 38. Is that right? 38? Is it right? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and uh, she basically had sound. It is not painful. Is that right? Uh, she's a, she says that it pains uh, 20 to 30 percent. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, then it's a good idea to see her really because uh, what could be happening is that there could be a loose body in the knee. Uh, which is basically getting jammed and, you know, this what we call a scripters, the sound of what you're describing. So that could be the thing. So just uh, having a look at her, uh, see if we can uh, sort of reproduce those sounds that she gets. And then, you know, getting simple investigation like X-ray might really help us to find if there is a loose body. And then we can see what category she really is in. Uh, if dad has already seen me for knee arthritis, I've said that it's advanced or something. I don't know what I've told dad. Uh, so we have to just reevaluate and see where he is now uh, in the scale and then take it further. Yeah. Yes, sir. My dad's father, sir, he is now age of 89. 89. Dad's father, huh? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, both of them have consulted you. So you set him to replace the knee. Okay. So uh, after the all this age, no, uh, we are not uh, that much, like we don't have a sure of... Uh, Replacing. He stays in Gavi Paramasi, your dad's father? Yes, yes, sir. We all, uh, we are all of uh, joint family. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
so i mean say if he doesn't have multiple uh, 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 you know problems like diabetes asthma and other host of 10 other uh, problems then age is not a, a contraindication you know i don't do ageism the oldest lady i operated in england was 96 actually and i still remember you know she sort of went home after four or five days and she wrote a very lovely letter so she said thank you mr shrikant uh, for doing a great job i never been hospitalized the first time i ever in my life i got hospitalized and all of you looked after me well and uh, she went home so she was never admitted for any other medical issues uh, before at all so uh, you know age is not a contraindication uh, you know uh you know if somebody has multiple problems like you know bar three bypass diabetes uncontrolled you know uh, then we have to be a bit careful you know even that is not a contrary indication but we are careful but uh, you know we don't do ages of oh you are 70 you know too old you know why do you want to undergo surgery we don't do that kind of thing that's actually wrong you know so uh, but uh, yeah so definitely they can see where things are and if the pain is significantly affecting then you know it's it's worthwhile but uh, if the pain is well managed then that's a different story sir ravi need to do for both the knees sir uh, he has bp and diabetes yeah, yeah. is the diabetes under control yes sir yeah then then, then it's okay i mean say then it's okay yeah. you know because my, a lot of my patients you know they have uh, one uh, single vessel bypass or two vessel bypass plus diabetes plus uh, asthma and something else and uh, you know we sort of look after and my anesthetist is always used to joke you know particularly in uk used to say shrikan where do you get these patients from all of them we there is a asa grading you know asa 1 2 five you know five means the worst kind of uh, medical condition and he used to say my patients were three uh, three and a half to four so they really sick patients uh, you know when we do we just not think only about orthopedics and knee replacement or hey but we think overall about the patient so what is this patient has diabetes hypertension he's got asthma he had two vessel disease so how do we manage that also so holistically we don't just think oh just this is just a knee or a hip or a finger you know I, I, uh, other things i don't concern me i'm not like that i'm first a doctor next a surgeon so you know we look at holistically yeah sir then for me sir i am the age of 20 okay. if i sit for long uh, hours for online class or something like that and i do yoga also from uh, past two and a half years i'm practicing yoga uh, i also get the same things sir uh, i get the sounds you are studying right now you are studying yes sir i am doing bca yeah, yeah 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 so basically you know uh, knee uh, uh, is one of the first joints where the sound starts coming actually so one is called a benign crepitus we don't worry about it you know many people get it uh, but one is second is a pathological crepitus where it causes pain locking swelling jamming you know that kind of a thing so then uh, that that needs to be treated somebody young like you getting crepitus i would not worry too much unless it causes pain or swelling if it causes pain and swelling then you need to come and see because uh, we need to know what's happening with the cartilage yeah yes sir uh, uh, can you tell the food the what we have to eat or how we need to take it yeah basically the food which sort of helps uh, the bone health really for, for example, uh, you know uh, oranges green leafy vegetables and if you take uh, you know the pizza and uh, this uh, cheese uh, they are all very rich source of calcium and vitamin d so those kinds of thing you can take if you take non vegetarian then you can have fish you can have uh, liver you know those things are very rich in vitamin d and uh, calcium so i think that should really do really yes sir i walk for 6 uh, to 7 kilometers and i don't eat uh, the outside foods and oily items and all uh why do i do yoga is for being fit and uh, my father is uh, when when he got back uh, operated the disc operated he got uh, from then he has started yoga uh, so i also started yoga by seeing him okay that's so that's really good i think you know movement is life you know so if we don't move nature has got like either use it or lose it you know if you don't lo- use it and stay at a single room then nature will not uh, you know make those f- faculties will take take away that, that's why you know movement is life and we need to encourage everything to move really. I, it's great that you do 7 kilometers walk each day it's fantastic yes sir depending on the age also like uh, not the age the weight also the knee pain it comes Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, you know, if you look at knee and the hip, uh, knee takes eight times. You know, suppose you know, I'll just give an example. This is uh, for easy, easy mathematics. Suppose uh, you know you are say hundred kilograms, then you know knee takes around hundred into eight. Eight hundred kgs go through the knee. In the hip, if you are hundred kgs, 
then it takes three times the body weight. That means uh, 300 kgs go through the hip. So there's a lot of force going through the hip joint and the knee joint. So that's why weight reduction is very important. If somebody is obese, you know, they need to cut down to ideal body weight then they're uh, reducing the, you know, the load on the joint quite significantly. So I think weight reduction is a very, very important thing in uh, management of arthritis. Yeah. And the weight of 50, sir. So only I'm getting the knee pain or sounds like that. Yeah, I mean, you look at your ideal body weight for your, uh, you know, age, uh, there'll be ideal body weight. Try to maintain the weight within that range. I mean, that's important because you don't want to load the knee. Like if you say 50, 15 to 8, 400 kgs is going through the knee. So then you don't want to put so much pressure, isn't it? So, you know, you can only put uh, pressure that the knee can handle. Okay. Hmm? Ankita, thank you very much. I think good questions from thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I probably will also request uh, others in the uh, in the in the program if you have any questions pertaining to the knee, kindly please. Uh, you know, you can unmute yourself and please uh, ask your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Ankita. Good evening, uh, Dr. Shekhan. This is Venkat here from Coimbatore. Hi, Venkat. Hi. Uh, thanks for your time uh, on this program today. I just wanted to ask you uh, one question, you know, I am 55 years, I mean, almost like uh, Sri Khan's age. Okay. Um, I do uh, walking in the morning, you know, uh, sometimes I, I skip walking, right? Uh, you know, a couple of days. So uh, I get, you know, what Ankita is saying, uh, that pain, uh, not, not exactly pain, that sound. And, you know, there is some sort of a difficulty in walking. But then once I continue walking and you know, do some stretching, it's all right. So I just wanted to find out, is, is there something in terms of, uh, you know, activity that I can do to reduce that or continuous walking will, con uh, will clear this off? Yeah, so is it because I'm stopping it's happening uh, or is, is, it, is there any condition behind it I mean, medically? I mean, uh, uh, the main thing, uh, you're saying that when you walk, you get... Uh, the sound crepitus is that right? So and then you get pain. Uh, is that what you're saying? It's not pain. It's like uh, suddenly you know I light pain and little sound. But then when I continue walking and uh, when I you know do squatting and stretching, yeah. that pain is gone and that uh, sound is gone and I'm okay. Okay. So is is it that no inertia that is happening or is there any medical condition? Uh, I just want to ask. It could be uh, low inertia, but uh, I think sound is normal. Pain is abnormal. Okay, the way it should not pain. So if you're repeatedly getting pain, sort of nature is telling you there's something not right. You know that's what uh, pain indicates. Any part of the body, you know, it indicates that something is not right. That means to, you need to get it checked over. So uh, okay. if it's just a, a sound, then I would not bother so much. But uh, you know, uh, uh, but if it is a uh, if it's sound associated with pain, then I would uh, try to see an orthopedic surgeon and see at least get some basic X-rays and see what's going on. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. I'll do that. Hmm. Sanjay, do you have a question? Sanjay? Yeah, uh, but my question would be uh, I don't know whether I should speak about it. Uh, doctor, yes. I am 57 now and I am obese. Uh, not only obese, I don't know if there's any term called super obese. I'm, I weigh about 120 kgs. Okay, yeah. And uh, thankfully, I don't have any joint pains right now. But I do face a challenge in walking. Okay. And when I was uh, talking to a doctor friend of mine, I was suggested that, okay, you'll need to pull down your weight. So ideal weight should have been somewhere around 70 so it takes 50 kgs, almost removing a Shrikant out of me. Shrikant, uh, Sanjay, Sanjay, I would request, <laughs> Sanjay, if you can just switch on your video, maybe we could uh, see you as well. Uh, well, okay. Just a moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it says you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. Okay, let me just allow you that. Uh, start with start video. I mean, I, I I basically want you to kind of um, enable. Yeah, okay, can see uh, somebody. Yeah, you're there, Sanjay. 
Yeah, I just try. Yeah, yeah we moment. can see you now. Yeah, okay, okay, great. Okay. Good. Doctor, I means, uh, as you would see, uh, I don't know if it can capture the whole of the body, but I am really heavily built. Okay, yeah. Okay, and the biggest challenge I face, doctor, is uh, on the weight reduction front. Uh, I know the importance. I know the uh, importance of you know switching on to all protein diet and all 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 of that. But the only motivation in my life I have is eating good food. And if that also goes off, then where is the uh, even if I am hundred percent fit, I am seventy kgs, and I don't have a desire to live. What will I do? Hmm. I completely understand where you're coming from. So, yeah. So, so Dr. Dek, uh, is there, is there, means, uh, say, just in case, if I have a problem, uh, recently I've had, uh, during the corona, first wave uh, time, I, I had a slip and fall in the bathroom. And, okay, I didn't know that it was a fracture. Then almost after one and a half year, uh, after the second wave was gone, I went to consult a, a doctor, senior doctor, and uh, MRI was done. And they said, okay, there was a fracture. It is not healed very well. That's the a reason. Fracture of which bone, actually? Uh, he said uh, in the near the hip bone. Oh, hip, hip fracture. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he said it is not healed well, but uh, you are doing pretty well uh, despite that. Okay. And then uh, he also said uh, L2, L3, and some uh, there's some kind of uh, compression which is seen, but he said it's not adverse. Uh, right. At this point in time, the best thing you can do is reduce your weight. Right. And honestly, I have been trying to do that. Mm -hmm. I am a diabetic. I am uh, a mild hypertensive. Um, doctor said, no, you don't even need uh, antihypertensive at this point in time. But diabetes was uh, not very well controlled at that point in time. But okay, uh, I've done well with my diabetes now for the last 45 days uh, in the in terms of management. But yeah. weight reduction is becoming a, a major challenge for me because uh, whatever I try, eating a lot of dal and, uh, you know, it just doesn't uh, add on. I don't know what to do with it <laughs> or uh, should I give it up? Sanjay, you are in Bangalore or you are in Coimbatore? Where are you based? I am in Co I am in Bangalore, very much yeah. in Bangalore. Sir. Oh, I'm in Bangalore. Okay, fine. So uh, I, I understand. You know, you enjoy eating, and there's nothing wrong in that. So you know, uh, 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 so weight. You said that uh, you may be sort of 50 kgs uh, in excess, and uh, you know, the basically weight has got relationship with diabetes, as you know. I think uh, the body sort of becomes resistant to insulin, actually. And also the immunity also comes down a little bit uh, with that, uh, not only diabetes, but also obesity and uh, with the corona pandemic as well. So I think ideally, maybe good uh, uh, that if there is uh, a possibility to reduce weight, I know it is challenging, it's easier said than done. Uh, but you know, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, you need to uh, sort of uh, decide for yourself, how do I go about, do I really, uh, can I get rid of this 50 kg and still enjoy eating. That's what is an ideal win-win situation, really. So, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously, if we uh, want to drastically reduce, there are methods like, you know, gastric banding and, uh, you know, there's so many procedures described to uh, gastric bypass and all those things uh, that sort of drastically reduces weight. But uh, so sort of you need a disciplined uh, thing post-surgery to maintain it. Otherwise, you know, we can easily put on weight, whatever we last 20, 30 kgs, it can be easily put on. Uh, what I'll do is I'll uh, first ask uh, Hemant who has come a uh, few questions about his own surgery, his own journey. Uh, Hemant is an amazing guy. He's an IT person and he's also into, uh, you know, this uh, a lot of uh, nutrition. He's a nutritionist as, as well. That is his hobby. And uh, he uh, does a lot of work on weight reduction as well. So we can get his sort of professional input as well regarding waiting, how to eat uh, enjoyable food at the same time reduce weight. So probably I'll sort of ask that question to Hemant. So uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Heyman to unmute and uh, I again welcome Heyman for coming uh, at short notice to this program and uh, sort of uh, agreeing to discuss uh, his own journey really. So thanks Heyman for that. And uh, 
so basically, uh, uh, you know, I met Hemant uh, because he was into Amway and that's how I met. And uh, when I saw him uh, for a clinic for a different reason, uh, I was not very happy that, uh, you know, he was limping at that, that time. I, then I asked casually, Hemant, why is that it's, it's happening? Then Hemant told his story. So I'll just allow Hemant to tell his story. Okay. First yeah. of all, thank you, doctor, for uh, inviting me to this uh, best uh, uh, platform to share whatever I know, whatever I have felt and experienced. And uh, thanks for all that. And thanks for a, a flattering introduction. <laughs> I may not be so... <laughs> The, the level that you are talking about, anyway, fine. So uh, thanks a lot. So uh, do you want me to tell the story of uh, how what all happened, or just yeah, yeah, just, just uh, how how you sort of uh, yeah what what happened and you know. Okay, okay, okay. So basically, for uh, uh, people here, uh, what happened in two thousand five? Uh, I was uh, coming back from office. I got down from the bus. It was evening, five thirty, and it was a very windy day. Okay, um, so um, I I was just walking on the footpath uh, near my home in Basanguri and suddenly there was a crackling sound over my head. And within uh, seconds, I could see that a huge branch of a tree was coming down on me. Okay, so huge branch means it was as thick as me. Okay, my my trunk. You can imagine I could have uh, gone that day. Okay, it was God's will, whatever I survived today, and then I'm doing fine. And of course, God uh, messengers of God like Dr. Srikanth, of course. Right. So, what happened was uh, in seconds I just moved a little further, and instead of landing on my head, it, the trunk uh, landed on my shoulder. So it didn't come down fully heavily. Otherwise, I would have probably gone by then. It just cracked, and then it slowly came down and pushed me to the ground. Okay. So when it pushed me to the ground, I had the D78 uh, discs in the back uh, got fractured. Fractured means just got compressed. Fortunately, it didn't touch the spine. Uh, it would have paralyzed me otherwise. So I just compressed directly vertically, and then uh, also my uh, uh, what is that? The tip, uh, the uh, thigh got twisted completely because of the weight of the trunk, uh, the branch, and then uh, I had multiple fractures in the thigh joint, right side thigh, okay, the uh, femur, femur uh, joint. So that is when uh, immediately I was hospitalized that day, and uh, I passed out for some time, and then when I regained consciousness, I was in hospital. Then uh, two days later, there was a surgery done, and that time, 2005, it was some screw, metallic screws that were put. So after the screw was put, okay, I came back, and in two months, I started walking, and it was all fine. I went back to office and all that. And then, uh, but what happened uh, over years, what happened, the screw joint started uh, uh, basically uh, giving in. So it was uh, kind of uh, failing, that joint. So what happened was I could already feel that uh, my right leg was a few inches, maybe a one inch or whatever. Doctor, you know better. You know you have measured it. Okay? One inch or whatever less than the left foot, left leg. So I started limping uh, around 2012 or 13. I started limping badly. Uh, doctor, at that time I think I met you and then you observed it. And then uh, I saw that uh, because of the back problems started because of the limping that I started to have in 2012-13. That is almost uh, seven, eight years after the first surgery. Uh, I started limping, and a lot of back problems started happening. I had to go for acupressure therapy, a lot of other therapies, and all that. That is when Dr. Shikan came in. I met him because of Neutralite, uh, which I am basically I'm into this business and all that. Uh, I met him. It was a cold contact. I just walked into his clinic. That, that was a turning point. And then he observed this and he asked what happened. Then it all led to me uh, being treated by him. He said, yeah, you have to get a, a surgery done. This joint is failed, right? The screws have basically failed. So he talked about a tantalum joint, which is a very modern, uh, what is ceramic, whatever, uh, joint, which is imported from Germany, as that's what I heard. So in 2014, I think uh, I got operated in June. Uh, um, right? And uh, uh, that's how he replaced the joint. And today I'm walking straight without any limp, uh, almost Maybe a few mm, but it, just, it's not noticeable at all. And uh, fortunately, the joint is so strong. He says that uh, even if you break your leg, the joint will not break. So that's the kind of joint that is there. And it may come for 30, 35 years, depending on how I manage it. Now it's almost... Uh, permission, uh, you know, at that time in India, we were not using this tantalum so much. So he had a very unique, uh, almost like a customized kind of uh, uh, tantalum implant from Zimmer company. And sort of that sort of fuses grows into the bone, and then the bone goes into it. They sort of become very one unit. And as Simon said, you know, it's very difficult to remove it. You know, during revision surgery, we really struggle 
you know and uh, you know uh, so things went very well for him and uh, in fact he told me uh, that after many years he could take his uh, wife and kids and drive to mysore for dasara you know when dasara happens it uh, three or four hours drive you get stuck in traffic so he could do that so i was very last pleased. year uh, for your information last december we drove to goa and back goa wow. okay i drove uh, i mean we shared the driving but then of course i'm normal okay so that's fantastic thanks thanks a lot and any kind of uh, this is very common in india you know any kind of apprehension you had before surgery understand in your own family you had doctors and uh, always in you know, as human beings in india particularly we get multiple advisors so sometimes it can be challenging yeah. but how did you overcome those challenges uh, in what way i didn't understand that uh, let me say uh, was there any apprehension before surgery ah, okay, okay, okay. you can get multiple yeah. opinion yeah yeah i know i know See, basically, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, I had a bad experience in 2005. See, it's not that I'm blaming the other doctors, but then that was that time the technology was uh, not so great, and then probably the Indian doctors had that that limited technology in their hands. I don't know. It was a metallic screw, whatever. It could have rusted over a period of time, also if I had left it as it is. So, uh, but Doctor Shrikant uh, was. Uh, I came to know immediately when he talked about it. The precision surgery he was talking about. The uh, what is it? before surgery and after what is it just before surgery also you would make some measurements take measurements so that planning planning pre operative planning yeah, the pre operative operative planning was top class that is what gave me a lot of uh, uh, confidence but one thing i'll tell you uh, frankly at home they were very doubtful uh, you are just jumping in without thinking much and then uh, you don't know this doctor much uh, you just uh, met him a few months back and all that stuff they talked about but i was hell bent on doing this because i believe the by the, the whatever he spoke and the, his knowledge and all that his uh, experience in uk and all that so uh, it, it worked out well of course uh, today i see uh, everybody is happy they know it's been a fantastic job actually uh, now uh, my life is better otherwise you imagine what would have happened to me uh, god fill and thank you doctor for all that so that was apprehension which was solved in mean, no time and now everybody everybody acknowledges this. So there's a lot of fear that it can lead to infection and all other things, but uh, you know yeah. that should Hemant has done well. Thanks Hemant for sharing. So thank you very much. Uh, yeah. I just want you to share about your uh, because uh, knowing you, I, this is what happens with most of my patients. I operate and uh, we end up with some kind of uh, business or other things, you know, in their own personal life. You know, in fact, other patients have invested in some of their. One was a movie producer and uh, and. i put some of my money in this movie as well after surgery so this now you know the relationship grows uh, not just as a doctor patient but also beyond as well and uh, that's happened with him and as well and uh, you know he's into nutrition and other things so if you can share and see if you can help uh, mr sanjay anyway so you can share your uh, you okay. know thoughts on that okay. i would like i would like to promote the business on this platform but then yes uh, i'm a certified nutritionist uh, with nutrilite uh, which is the uh, number one supplement in the world today. of course uh, pers- personally one on one we can talk if required uh, we give holistic nutrition and uh, lifestyle recommendations lot of weight management uh, programs are there uh, and of course glucosamine for uh, glucosamine hydrochloride for uh, uh, painful joints uh, many people talked about uh, painful joints so with glucosamine we have seen that operation surgeries can be postponed or maybe uh, may not be required for some cases because uh, the the cartilage if it can be regenerated they don't need to have a knee replacement surgery as such of course i'm not telling doctor you have to go i mean uh, for your business it might be a, a problem but then the point is we have a space for glucosamine we got always four stages of arthritis stage 1 yes. to i use glucosamine quite a lot stage 3 and 4 you know the you know work is yeah. really helpful yeah. so that yeah. we recommend surgery yeah, yeah. when when of, of course a cartilage cannot be regenerated your glucosamine does not do anything cannot do anything so you need surgery at that time in the initial stages when cartilage can be uh, regenerated it will do the job fantastic job it does so a creaky joints which is for youngsters like somebody just spoke uh, uh, i think for them it will help for old people where uh, um, the uh, joint uh, cartilage has uh, completely failed there is no more regeneration there is no cartilage and you know it can't work on the then you cannot do anything but surgery thanks mr hemant thank you very much uh, uh, i think i think what i would request now is uh, uh, let's be democratic and let's also invite and uh, request mr raghavan sridharan who is uh, i think also in the meeting uh mr ragwan uh, i i i don't know if you're from are you from the gayatri group 
Are you from Chennai? Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm from Chennai. Yes, that's right. That's wonderful. Okay, my name is Srikanth, and um, you know I'm also part of the Gayatri group. Uh, so welcome to this program. Uh, since you've been there and you've been also attending this program, I thought it's uh, it's fair for me to um, ask you, and uh, you know I love you to ask some questions if you have. Sure, thank you, sir. Yeah. So basically, like uh, I uh, I have like two questions. Like, yeah, go ahead, please. So. Uh, uh, I I actually like like couple of like I think like five years back, what happened is like I uh, slipped in my uh, inside my home, uh, like uh, there was a water spillage and I didn't notice it and just uh, slipped it slipped and uh, my left shoulder uh, I had a like uh, I had a very bad fall and uh, left I couldn't lift my left shoulder. So then I went to a doctor and uh, I got it. Uh, uh, like there was some kind of a uh, Hand hand rest. So after that, I was able to kind of like get back to normal. Then mm -hmm. again, I, I fell inside the bathroom once. So I, I again slipped and uh, I, again same left left hand was uh, affected. So at this time, I think it was like uh, for much longer period. Like I think uh, for one month, I was uh, I was wearing that uh, kind of head uh, hand rest. Uh, so afterwards, I was normal. Uh, but now, like since it's, it has been like more than five years, uh, occasionally, like uh, when I play cricket or something, whenever I uh, uh, there is a sudden movement in my left hand, uh, it gets dislocated. So kind of like it it gets in an awkward position. I have a lot of pain, uh, but after some time, it is it is back to normal. So you uh, mean to say, Mr. Raghavan, the shoulder dislocates? Is that what you are saying? Yeah, yeah, the, the, in the arm, not exactly the shoulder. I think the, in the in the arm somewhere I have a pain. Uh, it it kind of it it uh, it is in an awkward position and it's uh, dislocated and it takes some time for me to get it back to normal. And uh, then it's then again it's everything is normal afterwards it's normal. But I feel like maybe uh, uh, is there anything like it didn't get healed completely? How old are I? If I might ask, what is your age and what do you do for a living? 38. Uh, I'm, uh, I work in IT. IT sector. Okay. And yeah. how many years ago the first dislocation happened when they put you in the back uh, or arm pouch? Yeah, it was like five five years. So five it, years. It is, yeah, it's just a kind of a hand that's like where, uh, where we, uh, it, it just like so that I don't have to lift my left hand. So yeah. it's kind of a resting position. It is in a resting position. So I just use my right hand for everything, but I just when, when the first fall happened in the bathroom, or did I get X-ray of the shoulder? Did they say the shoulder had come out of joint? Did they put it back in joint, or what did they, what did they do? Uh, no, actually, it was not in the shoulder. It is like in the arm, the middle of the elbow and the arm uh, shoulder joint. In the so middle between, of the, uh, between the shoulder and the elbow joint, is that right? Or between the elbow yeah, and the hand? Yeah. Elbow and the shoulder between the elbow and elbow and the shoulder. So that's the exactly in the middle. I had the pain. Uh -huh. So. Uh, I think like after uh, the second fall, uh, it was in the same place. Same place, pain. Yeah, same With place. With the shoulder yeah. and the elbow, you are getting correct. Pain. Correct, yeah. yeah. So should I should, uh, like? Uh, is this normal or like? Uh, maybe like is it not completely healed? That's what I wanted to. Yeah, I think about from what you are describing, it looks like an issue with the shoulder. So the the pain of the shoulder uh, can sort of come all the way from the neck. Uh, to actually uh, low back also, to up to the elbow. So, uh, you know, many times uh, patients often they come with elbow pain, but the problem is with the shoulder uh, because the shoulder has got different kinds of muscles. Uh, there are rotator cuff muscles, which the cricketers use to bowl, but uh, there is a secondary accessory muscles which come right from the neck, go all the way with the back, uh, back and also they come up to the trapezius here, the elbow. So once the primary muscles don't work, the secondary muscles get recruited. They overwork. And they say, oh, hang on, there's a problem there. You're not addressed. So you are making me overwork. They fatigue, they're tired. Then you start getting uh, elbow pain. You start getting pain between the shoulder and the elbow, as you said. Or you might get neck pain or you might get low back pain, you know. And uh, it's surprising, you know, because somebody with low back pain can be having their sh shoulder issues. So I think, you know, uh, pain is an indication, as I mentioned, that uh, something is not right. So you probably need to get it checked and see what is going on and then uh, take corrective measures. Really. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, and then second is regarding my mother. So she is 66 years old and uh, like uh, uh, like more than like uh, even like uh, two, three years back, we had a checkup uh, in uh, a complete health checkup and she has basically the knee pain. 
so basically she has knee knee joint pain and it has been there for several years uh, i would say like more than uh, 15 years she is she is having this and uh, um uh, so she uh, um uh, so she is basically like not ready for a, a knee replacement uh, that was that was the suggestion so she does, she doesn't have the Uh, there are two types of arthritis right and like the uh, i think the one is the rheumatoid arthritis and the other one so i think she doesn't have the rheumatoid arthritis uh, that was from the blood test we came to know and uh, so i think probably the other other type the osteoporosis or something so Osteo. yeah so that is that, that's what it was diagnosed and the doctor has advised for knee knee surgery okay. so that is both, knee. both the knees are one knee um i think one knee was uh, was advised and the probably second one also has to be done uh, uh, because it is very light uh, maybe like very in the initial stages probably so i think like initially this is set for one knee yeah one is advanced knee and one is uh, early knee arthritis yeah. correct oh, correct yeah. so but she is not uh, like you know ready or uh, uh, because like she has heard from her friends that it, it was not successful for some of them so we are not in a ready like like since it is not 100 percentage so we are not we have not gone forward uh, for that but right now she is taking like uh, some kind of oil massage and uh, uh, she is able to walk uh, uh, for some like, within the community we are able to walk like uh, very small distances uh, but she, she has some to, she can't go to shopping she can't go to temple can she do that independently uh, no no like i'm like she she can walk uh, within a short distance Uh, but lifting uh, her leg in a, like in a, for example a chair or two right uh, it will be a bit high uh, elevated uh, thing so lifting is very difficult for her a normal auto she can manage uh, but uh, a chair auto she cannot lift uh, the knee so um, and i think like even like uh, she has some uh, the back uh, pain if it all like prolonged the uh, Um, if she if she has to cook for a lot, like she's in a standing position for some time, right? Like while cooking a lot, so she has that back pain also. So uh, I see. Uh, I don't know if you managed to watch the knee talk uh, before. Uh, I don't know what stage you joined, uh, but uh, see, uh, knee surgery is mentioned as a quality of life improving surgery. So basically, there's only two reasons why it should be done. One is pain, you know, which can't be managed with medication. and second is uh, uh, your quality of life is being affected like activity of daily life you said she can't climb a chair or two okay so that is one thing you know or she can't climb stairs or she can't do her own shopping or her own uh, temple visits so these are all quality of life you know the quality of life should not be affected if that is not affected yes you said she is waiting for 15 years waiting another year is not a issue at all but if her quality is affected then you need to uh, make a choice really so uh, because uh, you know if your quality is affected still we are carrying on then first uh, you know it's pain and uh, pain comes next is deformity sets in so once deformity sets in you can see very old uh, you know elderly gentleman in villages walking with completely like a bow leg you know you can see the bow leg how they walk you know with a completely uh, kind of a, a painful uh, you know gait and uh, swaying from side to side you know those kinds of knees or almost like a dislocatable kind of uh, situation and they are bad uh, knees you know uh, basically one uh, the surgery becomes difficult for the surgeon that's number one second he has to use long rods in the thigh bone and the leg bone called as a you know extender rods and augments and these augments are although modi has managed to cap the knee pricing itself now it's around 60000 something but these augments and the rods uh, they are expensive they are you know uh, one is 30000 each like that so that high curves of surgery uh, by two times or you know one and a half two or three times varying uh, and the outcomes of those surgeries will poorer compared to uh, knee replacement done at an early stage so i think you know for all those uh, reasons you have to decide you know if the quality of life is affected is is, is she in pain and are we giving regular painkillers which can sort of damage kidney then you can take uh, you know decisions and as i mentioned robotic surgery is very very good and uh, we are doing very very minimal uh, amount of cuts and the pain is very minimal accuracy is very high now and they are getting discharged early blood transfusion is less pain is less so all the benefits are there so i think in 2021 being afraid oh somebody had a bad result that's why we are not getting done i think that is not a very strong and robust argument now at least in 2021 maybe Five years, six years ago, that may be true, but not now.
Okay, and is it uh, like uh, is this only in particular hospitals? This new technology is being used, or like is it like almost standard now in all the hospitals? No, oh, I think uh, use of robots. Robots do cost. Uh, there is a cost associated with the robots. So I think uh, they sort of uh, around fifteen crores, some of ten crores. So obviously, uh, the bigger setups can invest uh, such a huge amount of money uh, to do that. So obviously, small uh, hospitals. You now we I do navigation surgery where I use a computer and I do the surgery. Uh, that's possible in smaller units. But uh, yeah, so if you want a robot, then we have to. To use a bigger setup, and uh, still, you know, they managed to keep the cost uh, reasonable. Really, you know, it's not uh, skyrocketed and gone on completely unrealistic. It's not happened like that. And if you have got insurance, that covers anyway, so that's not an issue. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Raghavan. Uh, uh, doctor Shree, uh, I just want to have a quick question with you. Yeah. It's about what. Um, 840 now uh, yeah how many slides do you have of the hip? not not much really that's what i was about to tell him and if he's got a busy he can peel off and yeah. then another four or five slides are there uh, i'll okay so, can i can i go doctor because yeah, you can go him thank you so much to thank help you. with some studies so. thank you thank you i mean you had a busy thank day today and uh, okay, no, no, no. Much, uh you come uh, thank, thank you, you. Yeah, thank you it. so much for giving me this opportunity to help uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank like, you uh, Sanjay wants your number. I'll share uh, Sanjay. Sure. Number, no so. problem. I'll, I'll talk to you. No problem. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Take care. Take care. All of you. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye
and uh, sometimes if there is a fracture uh, like Heyman mentioned that 3D CT is important and uh, we use uh, this hip lock procedure quite a lot basically we inject the hip joint under an x-ray or ultrasound uh, to detect if the pain is coming from hip or joint and the treatment is same like me you know we rest and we avoid the postures that lead to pain and I mentioned about the analgesic ladder we use that uh, to control the pain and then weight loss uh, I think somebody asked about weight uh, you know how much weight goes through three times the body weight to the hip. We try to reduce the body weight to uh, lessen the burden on the joint. And physiotherapy definitely useful. And uh, guided injections, I mentioned. Uh, hip arthroscopy, you know, it's fairly novel. Last five to 10 years, we put a scope inside or a telescope inside the hip joint. And there is a lip called uh, labrum, astabla or labrum. Sometimes it's torn. We can just trim it or we can repair it. And that sort of delays the setting of uh, arthritis nowadays. And last but not the least is the hip replacement. I'll just briefly touch where we are in uh, 2021, really. So this is the, you know, thing, the hip, uh, the spine, pelvic axis. Uh, this is the latest topic, really. And you can see here, there are three x-rays. On the left, there is a, a hip replacement, which is a well done. You saw the animated video, how this was done. So this is a well done hip replacement. But sadly, you know, in the middle picture, you can see the head uh, has come out of the socket really. So it is, uh, this hip has a dislocated, has come out of the socket. And in the picture on the right, uh, uh, a re-surgery, a revision surgery has been done. It's been put back, a different stem has been used and different head has been used to make the whole construct stable. And why did that happen? It happened because the surgeon uh, sort of missed a stiff spine that the patient had. And always as arthritic surgeons, we are traditionally taught, you know, look at the joint and one joint above and below. And, uh, you know, sometimes if this gets missed, these kinds of dislocations do happen and further surgery may be needed. And, uh, you know, I was speaking to my friend who is a professor of robotic surgery in Birmingham, Professor Ed Davies, and uh, he's been doing robotic hip surgery for the last one year. I asked him, Ed, you know, what is this? You know, what is this mystery happening with the hip and spine? He said the relationship between our spine, which is a Benuri, and the pelvis and the hip is so complex now that there's so many algorithms coming and this is going to be the future challenge. So I would again say that these replacements have to be done by a senior guy. Otherwise, we can get into the trouble, you know, which the surgeon has got in the middle picture here, really. And, uh, you know, this is another uh, x-ray where, you know, simple is not easy. Easy is not always good and cheap can be sometimes cheerful. Uh, here, again, a hip done on the right-hand side. You can see the x-ray. Uh, sort of looks okay to look at it, but the patient felt that the right leg was a little longer, so he was not very happy. And uh, this happened because of the use of uh, off-the-shelf kind of an implant, what we call as uncemented implants. Uh, and these implants really want to go where they want to go. You can't really uh, put where you want to put really. So they've got a mind of their own. And they're quick to put, they're easy to quit, they're easy to put, so they're very, very uh, popular, but, uh, you know, they're financially good for the hospital also. But, you know, what about the patient? You know, you need to be a patient advocate. You know, it's very, very important that one needs to be a patient advocate and see what this patient needs and match the processes to the patient rather than, uh, you know, like we were discussing about Haven surgery. I had to get those specialized implants from, uh, you know, Germany and US and put those uh, cups, which was quite rare at that time, and then do the surgery. So this is a sort of solution in 2021, what we call as a, a cemented hip, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, where you can precisely control all these uh, different uh, versions. OPS, uh, this is a new software is not in India at present. Robotics, we are using it in hip. And, uh, you know, uh, don't mistake, somebody uh, said the, that, you know, a cemented hip, but I put a picture of the uncemented hip here on the left-hand side. But this is not an off-the-shelf uh, uncemented hip. You know, this is a very specialized hip called as a custom hip, where looking at all the different deformities and challenges, they were 3D printed, they got a CT before and they 3D printed this implant. And uh, this is a, like an exact fit anatomic uh, hip replacement. Uh, and it will exactly reproduce the patient's uh, you know, limb length and everything. So this is different compared to the traditional off the shelf uh, uncemented hip replacement. And this does lead to better functional result and uh, longer life. This company Symbios is not even in India, but you know, I think future, these things are going to happen. So my take home messages uh, for today's talk and also to uh, juniors, I give this talk to my juniors also, is that get it right first time is an important and evolving concept in uh, joint replacement surgery. The insurers, the patients and the legal fraternity will demand this more from surgeons in the future. Revision knee or revision hip surgery is a complex area of work, can take two to six hours and hence it needs patience, resilience, passion, teamwork, experience. 
and I tell my juniors that one can run out of steam after two, two and a half hours of being in theatre and you feel like, let's close this one and get out and come back another day and deal with it. So it is not for the novice and you need to be highly experienced to get involved in complex surgeries. Training is a must to perform these complex work to acceptable standards. Uh, one of the top surgeons in UK, Mr. Beverland, he only does primary hip replacement. He uh, uh, refers all the revision surgery to revision surgeons because he's not trained to do that. So similarly in UK, all the infected revisions are referred by revision surgeons to consultants who do revision surgery. So, you know, there's no macho, uh, macoism involved here. Patient safety is at the bottom uh, and the most important thing. And uh, there's no harm in referring these complex surgeries. And life is short, as we know. So why honestly take risks? So I would like to say that, you know, in the UK, there was a popular saying, when in doubt, refer to appropriate trained specialists, uh, you know, to get an optimum outcome for the patient. To conclude, I would say Sarthi Specialty Orthopedic Center, uh, Bangalore offers the best the world has in joint replacement surgery. Patient safety is at the heart of the care, which you also saw in all the slides. Uh, we try to provide two standards. Uh, surgery is trained by both the European Hip Society President and the British Hip Society President. And in short, I could say, experience Europe in Bangalore. I really thank you all for the patient listening. I like this quote from Aristotle. You know, we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence is therefore not an act, but a habit. So I really uh, request, uh, you know, all of you to uh, support in my cause to serve these patients better. So these are my contact details. You can take a snapshot and uh, you can contact me or my uh, team here. And, uh, you know, those who are in Gavipuram can obviously drop in and meet or in Tanakpura Road can meet me. Uh, others can fix an appointment and always uh, I'm there uh, available really. So I thank you very much. Srikanth, uh, special thanks to you for organizing this and uh, thanks to all of your friends who joined and to Ankita and Heyman who came at short notice. Uh, if any questions is there, I can take it now. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Srikanth, for your time. I think, uh, which is uh, very, very important on your side as well. I know you had a long day today, though it was a weekend. Um, you know, I, I, I got your message that you were in an emergency surgery in the afternoon. <clears throat> Sorry. So thank you very much for sparing your Saturday evening. Uh, uh, regret that, unfortunately, there weren't many participants today. Uh, but I think hopefully... It's been recorded as a YouTube uh, recording. It went live on YouTube. So I, I will send the link. And any of your friends who are missed today, they can always watch it. That's not yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, maybe we could also look at another day, perhaps, uh, you know, not a weekend. So, so let's look at it on a different day. Uh, having said that, thank you very much for your time. Uh, pleasure, obviously, you know, kind of listening to your, uh, uh, you know, presentation. Uh, thanks, of course, to my good friends uh, for their time as well. Uh, Sanjay, Venkat. Uh, well, Raghavan, uh, we haven't met, but uh, nevertheless, thank you very much. And Ankita, nice knowing you. Uh, Hemant, he was here with us for some time. I think he must have gone for his work. Thanks to Hemant as well. Uh, should you guys have any questions on the hip? To Dr. Srikant, we will probably, you know, hold on for some time. Do you all have any questions on the hip, please? Oh, no, nothing from my end, Srikant. Okay, great. Sanjay? None, none at this point in time. Okay, great. Great. Ankita, you have asked some questions at the beginning. I think uh, that was more related to your knees uh, for your father and maybe your mother and maybe your grandfather as well. Uh, do you have something on the hips in case you want to ask? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Raghavan, is there anything that you might want to further ask Dr. Srikant before we sign off? Uh, no, I am fine. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much and uh, pleasure knowing you all and uh, of course having you all in this program. Uh, so, so let's see if I can try and do this uh, repetitive program, uh, depending on, I think, uh, my time as well and Dr. Srikant's availability more importantly. So, so thank you very much, Dr. Srikant. Yeah. Thanks, Srikant. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining. Uh, I'll send yeah. the recording to Srikant. He can share with uh, you yeah. and uh, those who are not coming to watch it. Uh, so have a good weekend. I just finished the surgery. Just entered home at 6.30, just in time for this meeting, which is fantastic. Lovely. Thank Lovely. You. Thank, thank you. So nice. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.